If you uh, look at the, the viewfinder, uh, for those of you who uh, looked at the B model, the B model is the trainer, which has got two cockpits. It's uh, basically a, a pilot's airplane. But uh, you don't have a good perspective of the A model, which is the operational airplane. And uh, 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 Doug was an instructor RSO in the back seat, and the goodies, he was, he was taking care of all the goodies. I was just keeping the pointy head forward. So what the plan is, is uh, we're going to show you both cockpits. Uh, one of the cockpits uh, has a 360 visual. It's a little bit easy. Uh, the back seat, uh, there were too many parts missing, so uh, Doug's done a great job to uh, show you where each individual part is. And this is a QA. and a uh, you want to ask a question, just yell it out. Uh, but you'll see the difference between the uh, double B and uh, the A, but you'll see where all the goodies are, where the defensive systems are, the navigation systems are, and uh, it should be fun. It should be fun. Okay, we got it. Okay, uh, that's when we uh, didn't dye our hair. Uh, uh, we're a little younger. Uh, that's uh, uh, Doug and, uh, and Smith. Uh, they were a crew, and that's, uh, that's myself. I then dyed my hair a little later, uh, Mac and I. Uh, but we were very blessed, incredibly, incredibly blessed to fly the airplane. Uh, there are many things that uh, you've heard during the first presentation. And every time we do one of these, we learn something different. We learn something new. Uh, I was just up at the cockpit, and... One, one junior asked me, well, what did, what did it look like at night? And, and basically, the views at night were absolutely spectacular, uh, uh, the colors. You get mesmerized by the indigos and the blues when you go by the Terminator. So we're, we're so blessed to be able to fly that airplane. Okay, so it's an engineering marvel. When you look at this bird, hey, guys, this is 1963. Go up in the cockpit, near the cockpit, look back. We're flying Lockheed Constellations across the country with propellers in 1959. And this plane basically had a full design by, by 1960. And it still remains a, a, a beautiful machine. Okay, if there's only four slides you remember here, please remember these four slides. This, this, is, this is critical. You're, you're gonna forget the cockpit, but don't forget these slides. First, we rented, we rented the airplane. We didn't, we didn't own the airplane. Maintenance owned the airplane. They owned the airplane, okay? And they were the best. Excellence was demanded. I don't think I've got uh, Tom and uh, Edie and Doug here, other pilots. We have never pre-flighted an SR-71. Tom, have you ever pre-flighted an SR-71? No. When Dave Burns' crew comes in and says, the bird is ready, guess what? The bird is ready. The bird is ready. I have never walked around an SR-71 saying, is the panel hooked up? Is the starter cart hooked up? I get in the airplane, shake the crew member's hand, and guess what? The bird is ready. That's the key. So remember those two. If there are any KC-135 pilots here, tanker drivers, we love you. We absolutely love you. And the that's, uh, and the NAVs, and the NAVs. Uh, that's, that's 350, the tanker's going as fast as it, as it can. Uh, we're struggling behind it at minimum afterburner. But we have never missed an operational refueling. In the darkest places of the Pacific, the worst weather in the world, the tanker rolls out two and a half miles right ahead of you every single time, and not a word is spoken. They've been through five refuelings. Four refueling, tanker rolls out right ahead of you in the middle of the night, every single time. And that's how good the program was. That's it. We, 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 were, we were worthless without KC-135 tankers. And for those females in the audience, I've been refueled by the best female pilots in the world. They were the greatest tanker drivers. They supported us, and they knew we needed the gas. They were, they were invaluable, totally invaluable. So remember those four slides, okay? Okay, the general plan. Uh, Doug's going to take over in just a second and go over the back seat and go through the back seat in, in total. You'll see where everything is. And uh, I, I can say this. I think Doug would maybe not agree, but the back seater, I don't call him a back seater because he's not. He's the orchestra leader. If you think about an orchestra, the, the first violinist walks in and the conductor shakes his hand, her hand. I'm the first violinist. I'm just keeping the pointy head forward. Doug is managing the checklist. He's managing the pacing. He's keeping me on track. You know, it, the, the front seat is so busy, 
and the back seat gets very busy. We know when to not talk to each other. But, but think of the RSO as the conductor orchestrating the mission. I'm the first violinist just doing the job, but I need some help time. And when you're behind the tanker in the middle of the night, and you're upside down, and Doug is saying, you're on track, you're perfectly level, you're doing a great job, we've got 2,000 pounds to go, and you punch off. You really need that guy in the back seat. Okay, so he'll do the back seat, then I have the blessing of doing a, uh, a 360, and we'll get, it, we'll get involved. The, the, the front seat is very similar to the two front seats you're gonna see up in the B model, and uh, uh, we can go through some of the really exotic gauges, but they're all steam gauges. There's not a single digital thing in the whole airplane. It's all steam gauges, okay? Okay, there's our new SR-71 cockpit. Where is that? That's the Spruce Goose up at Evergreen, if you ever get a chance to go up there. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, uh, there's Howard, and right behind us, there's a 360-gallon oil tank hooked up to eight engines. It's got, it, I, I, I look behind it, there's this tank. What's this tank? It's got 360 gallons of oil and, and eight tubes going to engines. It's really a, quite, a, quite a shot. There's your bird here, the trainer, and it's a little cramped, especially in the back seat. Uh, we're going to talk, there's the trainer cockpit, which you can see when you get up there. Uh, the A model we're going to talk about, and basically uh, 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 Doug would be in the back, I would be in the front. This is what it looks like in the front seat, and remember, for those of you that were up in the cockpit, that pie plate, that little front windscreen you see there, and, and Tom's going to do it with a laser, that's 620 degrees at speed. So that's what, twice, twice as hot as your turkey cooks in the oven, or if you clean your oven, it's about 600 degrees. That quartz pie plate, which we see out of, is 620 degrees at Mach 3.2. That's how hot the airplane gets. It's a thermal nightmare. Okay, there's the front seat, but I'm gonna give it to Doug now, and Doug's gonna go through the back seat. And if you have a quick question, just raise your hand and shout it out, and we'll try to answer any question you have. Thanks, Jerry. And as Jerry said, questions, just raise your hand. Just to add on to what Jerry said, the difference, the analogy of the pilot, the front seat of the back seat of the pilot, the RSO, the joke we always had in the squadron. The pilot, the front seater, drove us to work. If we got shot down, he would tell the enemy, the spy is in back, I just drove him to work. The other thing before I start, he seems like a nice guy, doesn't he? You guys met him up there, he comes across. Let me just tell you about Jerry Glasson. One story before I begin. So Mike and I, Mike was my front seater, started training in January 85, and Jerry was one of the senior IPs. So during our training period, we had different crews. Should I leave right you should instruct us. The first six months of the training was um, classroom and simulator before he wanted to fly. So one simulator training, Jerry was our IP. Well, Mike and I, I won't go into the specifics of what we did. We screwed up, granted, but it was a simulator. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Glasser shuts down the simulator. You could just tell he's red he's so angry at us says, get into the classroom. We walk into the classroom. He takes the eraser and throws it at us. True story, this is that nice man. He had a temple when he was instructing. Okay, <laughs> we, we made it through the program. This was my cockpit. Um, for all of you who have seen the cockpit up there, this is the B model. We only had one B model. B model was to train new pilots do check rides, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't built with sensors, the equipment that I ran. So you see the back seat up there is not basically the back seat in the A model, the operational plane. We did not have a stick, as you could see. There wouldn't be any use because we could not see forward. So, the, you know, basically, well, the next slide will tell you basically what we do. So, okay, this is a responsibility of an IR. People always ask, it, who is or what is the RSO? You could, it's a combination of being the co-pilot, the flight engineer, the sense operator, the navigation guy, all mixed in one. Um, we ran the radios, 
Uh, we obviously ran the navigation. We ran the sensors and did all the communication. So it was just, think of a co-pilot, flight engineer, navigator, sense operator, rolled into one role is what we did. It's not shown on this show, uh, slide. When Mike and I, my front seat had started, like I said, it was a year program. So you don't go, most of us were captains or majors when we got in the program. So most of us were in the Air Force for 10 years or so. So we were experienced. Still had a one year training, one year before we were operational, ready to go flying. So uh, there was uh, six months of academics and simulator, and then six months of simulating and flying before we were allowed to go on an operational mission. Okay, I just, you know, and a lot of guys up there, a lot of, especially kids said, how do you learn this cockpit with all those button and switches? And again, I said, it's a year training and you take it one section at a time. Here's the nav system. Here are the radio system. Here's the circuit breakers. So over time, everything is automatic. And you need to be, and the reason why you train together with one guy, as Jerry said, and fly with him. I flew with Mike for five years, is flying up Mach 3. When you're in a take area, if you're taking pictures somewhere in an operational mission and something goes wrong, if I say something, he sums just by the sound of our voice, we know what to do. I mean, we have been trained. We work as one. And it was real. When one of the guys operational got sick, got a cold, the other crew there would fly. Now, home at Beale Air Force Base, north of Sacramento, train missions, I flew, I flew with Jerry once. We didn't go very far, but I flew with him. We lost communication. But you could fly with a bunch of people. But on an operational mi uh, mission, you flew with your partner. So I'm going to go through and, like I said, uh, ask questions as they come up. I'm just going to basically show you what the backseat cockpit, that's the overview. It shows we have a viewfinder, a map, um, the ANS, which I'll go through, which was the magic of the whole plane navigational-wise for the 1960s before GPS, and the sensor uh, section. Okay, now, now we had several radios on board. We had, normally you talk on UHF, we had an HF, and eventually we got VHF for you guys that do fly uh, radio. The normal radio was UHF. We did reports when we were somewhere in the world over the HF, which had a lot of static. Um, but the backseater basically had the radios from starting engines, taxi, takeoff, through the mission, until you get back to the base and you started doing touch and goes into the pad. The front seat, it just made it easier to tell the tower what he was going to do. So he took over the radios at that time. Talking about radios, just so the operational missions, we were basically never on the radio. When we took off from Kadena and Mildenhall, when we left the hangar, it was all by lights. The ops officer would be in the tower and give us a green light to taxi. We'd taxi out to the hammerhead do our warm-ups, and then give us a green light to take off. Because it was operational, we didn't want any communication. And we took off, no communication, we didn't talk to anyone, and we were gone. In the States, it was different. Obviously, it was uh, training missions. Uh, we, the only thing different we did in the States, we did turn off the transponder when we uh, climbed above 60,000 uh, to show where we were and what altitude we were. Right section, which we'll go over in a few minutes more in detail, was the sensors. Basically, as I talked to everyone up at the cockpit, we did not have weapons. We carried cameras and sensors. Uh, we had Eland, Sigan. We were a collector. We just sucked up the information, mainly taking pictures or radar, depending on the weather. The nose fits <coughs> the OBC camera, the optical camera, when it was totally clear underneath, we, we could use that. But for most missions, especially in Kadena, we use a radar nose, because the radar could go through sea clouds. Real good story. I flew, Mike and I flew the last, longest mission, 
mission in the last 15 years of the program, 11.2 hours. We had flown from Kadena. They needed pictures of Iran in the Persian Gulf. <coughs> so um, we were lucky enough to get the mission. And um, um, we took off. Where's Eddie? Is Eddie here? Yeah, our backup crew wasn't with us. And it, like I said, it was an 11, two-hour mission. And I'll get into that in a minute. View site, we had a view site which basically let us see below the plane. And if it was, was clear, um, oh, that was what I was going to say about the long mission. So we took off with an OBC, the camera. Now, we had five refuelings during the 11 hours, basically undercast the whole time from Kadena, around Thailand, under India, and we get to the Straits of Hamoos. And they put on an OBC. This was a big mission. The information was going straight to the president. This was the summer of 87. Soon as we got in over the Straits, it just cleared up. There wasn't a cloud underneath. The OBC worked perfectly, and I told Mike as we, I said, there is some captain in the weather shop that's breathing a sigh of relief. Because if he sent us on that long mission with an OBC, such an important mission, and it was undercast, someone would have taken it. View sight did a lot of things, but a lot of the good things it did, it let the backseater, I remember, you know, in England and at Beale, Northern California, where a lot of fog, we'd be coming in, and Mike, at one point, would not see the runway with the fog and everything. I've been able to, and all the backseaters, pick out the stripes on the runway before he has visual of the runway and tell him, come left, left come right, you know, you're right in the middle of the runway. Map projection, we had a moving map that continually showed us the mission, and it was 1960s technology. It wasn't digital, it was a, on a reel, a moving you know, map of the area. And you could see the projector, and the, uh, the screen would fold down. I don't know if there's a picture of it. Okay, uh, the control panels, just slowly going down that list. You know, we had, um, as I said, uh, the bearing and distance, the, the one big thing is uh, what we had with the tankers. Like Jerry said, the tankers were our lifeblood, and we could not fly a mission without them. And we take off refuel, it's pretty easy to find them, but when we're doing, in the middle of a mission and we're coming back down to find a tanker, coming from the North Barents, Murmans, we had tracking and DMs, DME to the tanker. And those guys were there always on time. The only time, and I have to say one time, a tanker dis did disappoint me was the KC-10. It was on that long 11-hour mission. We were coming up to the Straits of Hamoos. Our last refueling before we were going into the Straits to do the mission. And the we needed to be right where they wanted us to cross the straits, and the KC-10 was seven to 10 miles left of course. Uh, I mean, he knew I was angry when I said, get your ass back over here, you know, to refuel us, to get us on uh, track. The 135s from Beale that were stationed with us, they knew us, they flew with us, they had navigators. We never had an issue with them. We used them from uh, Kadena when we were flying, refueling in the clouds, We'd ask the navigator for a heading because they had a ra weather radar, which we, we, we did not, and give us a heading to, to clear out of the area and take off. <coughs> and uh, you can see all the uh, information we, ha we had, I mean, uh, we, anyone have questions, I'm not going to go through each one. Um, we had the triple display. We had fuel quantity. We had um, CG indicator. 
CG is really important on a plane this uh, long. Uh, we had to keep the CG, what, about 25? 24, 25. It's 35 years since I've flown the plane, so I don't remember all the numbers perfectly. And how do you do that? By, you know, using fuel, by transferring the fuel to different tanks. So um, throughout the flight, it was critical, critical to keep the CG at, the, uh, at where it needs to be. Okay, uh, there's no slide, slide, well. Okay, that shows the IFF and TACAN. Uh, many of you that um, know aviation know what, that's the standard TACAN and IFF that small planes have, uh, information, friend or foe, TACAN gives you DME and bearing. Okay, another picture of the cockpit. That's a pretty clean picture. And the map projection, like I said, we had that moving map that folds down there. And again, Jerry said, this was built in the 1960s. When I flew it mid 80s, a lot of the equipment was upgraded, but internal equipment, DAFIX, um, uh, radios. But the basic plane wasn't even close to, it's not a glass cockpit. This was built in the 60s. Again, as I said, we had the moving map. We had a, a radar system. Let me get to, well, let me talk about the sensors. Okay, um, I'm gonna go through some of these things and uh, won't be exactly on the slide. So, how do you navigate at Mach 3 in the 1960s? There's no one INS, which eventually we did get. There's no GPS. We got an ANS, Astro Inertial System. Did North, who, who built that? Northrop? Northrop. Basically what it was, it was a star tracker. It was a fancy sex and celestial automatic. It tracked three stars, and according to them, it kept us within 300 feet of on course. In an operational mission, if we lost an ANS, we had to turn around and go home. Because it was that critical to be on the black line. In a training mission, there was one training flight that they had Mike and I, everyone in training, fly without the INS, uh, uh, the ANS, just to see how much of a handful. But the system was phenomenal. It tracked three stars. You knew where you were constantly, constantly. And as I said again, if you lost ANS in an operational mission, you turned around and came home. Sensors. A lot of the sensors were um, automatic. You know, we had cameras on the side, the tech cameras, along on the chime. Basically, they turned on and off automatically. We had radar that came on and off automatically. The uh, one critical sensor that was manually run by us was the OBC, that optical bar camera I told you in the front nose. That we had to turn on and off, you know, with knowing where we were. You know, we had the map telling us here, there. And I don't know why they never were able to make that automatic, but that was definitely, definitely. I had nightmares the night before that 11 hour mission, it was an important mission, that I'd get all the way to the Gulf and I forget to turn the OBC on and off. I mean, that's how critical that one is. Okay, I talked about the ANS, I mean that, you look at these buttons, you know, and circuit breakers and switches, and you say, how the hell could I do that? I don't know if you saw the suit, I think it's, yeah, it's over there with the gloves. If you haven't seen the pressure suit we wear, go, it's a big, bulky space suit and big, thick gloves. Um, so you could tell most of the buttons they could, they made bigger, um, but you ha also had a little thing there to press them if you need to do. But it, it was doable, it was doable. OK, 
Okay, again, the A and S. If you go up on the cockpit, behind the rear cockpit, someone even asked me yesterday, you see that little where it's circled, that glass pane. That was where the ANS captured the stars, right ahead of the refueling pod. And again, guaranteed to plus or minus 300 feet anywhere in the world, tracking at 2,200 miles per hour, 1960s, way before anyone knew about GPS, INS. We finally got an INS in the 80s, 70s, in the 80s. Yeah, they finally also added in INS. Oh, okay. Any questions now or we could do it afterwards? You mean, so, oh, you're asking how ours, how crew members were selected? And, okay, yeah, and size, yes. Okay, typical assignment in the United States Air Force is they give you an assignment. You know, you're going, you've done four years somewhere, here's your next assignment, buddy, whether you like it or not. SR-71 was one of the handful of programs that was called selective, a selective program. In other words, you had to first apply. So we have, well, wherever you are, whatever base, you send in a package. And your package included your OERs, offices, and performance reports, and your um, flight records, your evaluations over the years of flying. Okay? And letters of recommendation and a typical package. You sent that to BL Air Force Base, they would have a selection board just decide who to um, interview. So that was the first step, you know, does he pass the muster on OERs and flight evaluations. Get selected for the interview is only step one. Get selected, you come out to BL Air Force Base one week. First two days was full physicals, like, just like the astronauts took. I mean, a lot more than a normal annual flight physical. I don't know anyone in particular, but the story I've heard from a lot of people, there were a lot of guys in the United States Air Force that would not apply to the SR because they were worried about not passing that physical and then being grounded from the plane they're flying. So they didn't take the chance. So that was Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday was a simulator ride. Now, obviously, I told you it takes a year to learn how to fly the SR-71. What are you going to do in a day? Basically, you're going to impress the instructor. You're going to spend a day with an IP, an IN, and basically, the morning was him just pointing out, like I was, showing you the systems, showing you the buttons. This does this, this does this, this. Does. Then he takes you to lunch. Then that afternoon, you fly a mission. Now, of course, he knows in four hours, you're not flying the plane. Of course, he knows you're not going to know everything. It's going to take a year to train you. All he's looking for is this guy trainable. Does this guy know how to fly, how to do, can I train him? So that was a biggie, the simulator. Then the next two days, Thursday and Friday, the front seat is two, two T-38 flights. See how they can handle the stick. So that was a big thing. And the other thing, that, one of the most important things is just meeting and talking with the guys. It was almost like a fraternity. We were such a small group. We only had maybe 20 people in the squadron at one time. So, and you were gone with them 200, 250 days a year. That makes it real important, real important that you're gonna get along with this guy. So we had a form that the guys in the squadron will fill out after you left, after they interviewed you and uh, write, okay, this guy, fits what we want, or this guy doesn't. So you left that Friday. I did it in April. The next selection board, I was selected. I got the call in October that, yes, I, I was selected. And then uh, PCS to Sacramento, first week of January of that year, and met Mike. And I was fortunate enough that Mike and I became best friends, a great team, and uh, it worked out great for me. 
It was a great assignment. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, that's the rumor. I don't think even at the beginning that was true. Do you know? I've read that so many times and I've, I laughed. Absolutely not true. Not true. I don't know how that one started. Who, does that, who would say a married man's more stable than a bachelor? I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. An RSO is a train goes, pilot goes to UPT for a year, you know, when he's new second lieutenant. Uh, a navi uh, guy goes to navigate a training for a year. Totally different. He's the, he is officially wears navigator wings. In the SR, he's called an RSO. In an F4, he's called a WISO, weapon systems officer. Or, or both of them are backseaters. Jerry, you ready? Any more questions when Jerry's done? I'll be up here to ask. Hey guys. Okay, uh, this is the front seat, and uh, basically, if you get up into the into the airplane, which I hope you do, uh, I'm blessed that. I can sit here and move this around. I'm not, I don't want to make you throw up or anything. Uh, Tom, my buddy, is going to uh, uh, use a laser pointer, so. Uh, One, two, okay. Well, technology solved with a, with, a, with a pilot, I guess. Uh, so I have the blessing of moving this around and zooming in and zooming out. And uh, the, the, the back seat is almost similar to the front seat. There's a few things you can't do, but uh, this is exactly what you'll see in the front seat of the B model. And what we're going to do uh, quickly is uh, we're going to start from the left side of the airplane, and we'll start from the left side. And that's the canopy rail right there. That's where I'd rest my, uh, my arm and stuff. And we're going to zoom in. And we'll start from the left. And we're going to go all the way around the cockpit. And then Tom is going to use the laser to uh, highlight a few things that I may miss with my little pointer. I've got it yellow, but I may miss it. OK, so on the left side, and basically, there's some circuit breakers in the back, which we can't see. You kind of memorize circuit breakers. Uh, but all of our radios are on the left side. Our oxygen is on the left side. Our oxygen is on the left side. All the lighting is on the left side. There's not many lights. So uh, there are three oxygen systems, uh, two normal and one standby, and that's, that's good when you're wearing a pressure suit, especially for 11 hours. And then we're going to move up here slowly. There are the throttles, so when you get up there, you'll know what the throttles are. There's a couple of counters down here, and I'll zoom in a little bit. And it, the counter goes from 16 down. The engine is starting. The engine is started what's what's called triethylborine, and we have 16 shots. So when we start the engine, the counter goes down to 15. When we light the afterburners for takeoff, the counter goes down to 14. So basically, you have 16 shots for each engine to light the afterburner. And uh, for a long mission, you want to be careful because uh, uh, there's no other way to light it except there's a few things you can do. But it's very critical to have Teb on board. OK, these are the throttles. That's a friction lock. Uh, zooming in, whoops, excuse me. Don't want to do, be too fast here. Zooming in here, these two gauges seem very innocuous. But we can do minor maintenance on the engine. Uh, and that becomes critical sometimes when you want to when you want to decrease the thrust. Right, we're going to have fun here. Uh, you can actually change the EGT. I can up trim and down trim the engines 
and I can do some minor maintenance on the airplane. Uh, uh, at speed, the engine is a constant speed engine. It doesn't, the RPM is not going to change. And the engine, basically fuel flow at, at speed is less than idle. Uh, uh, it's an incredibly, if you, we'll do a little propulsion section for you later, but it's an amazing technology of the engine. So I can up trim and down trim the engines. These are F door switches. Supersonically, I can manage. There's a little technique here, but these control the aft doors of the inlet, and I can manage these manually. Uh, there's two sets of doors, a forward door, a forward door and an aft door, and uh, these are manually controlled by the pilot. So let's kind of, whoops, let's back out a little bit here. Back out, and let's move over. There's the... This is the left side of the cockpit. We're going to zoom in a little bit, slowly. OK. Here's, here's all, whoops, I'm sorry about that. Here's all our, our environmental system. Uh, there's our bay temperatures, left bay, right bay, cockpit. And we try to keep the front of the airplane below 140 degrees. The cockpit gets, can be 75, 80, 72, whatever but we try to keep the bay temperatures below 140. The rest of the airplane we leave to itself. It gets up to 550 to 600 degrees. Here's all my temperature controls, uh, suit controls, uh, uh, a pitot heat, landing gear. Uh, there's my temp controls, my refrigeration. There are two refrigeration packs that I can, I can turn on and turn off. I don't want to turn them off. Uh, all the landing stuff, anti-skid, uh, landing gear, landing gear handle, and let's kind of get up here. Critical one, we're flying at 26, this is the cabin pressure. We're flying at 26,000 feet cabin pressure. So we're breathing 100% oxygen for the entire time. Here's our liquid oxygen. We have, uh, there's, two, there's two, two indicators for three, for three uh, uh, doers. That's our liquid oxygen. But that's the left side. Let me just zoom back out again to show you where we are. And that's the entire left side of the cockpit. Okay, let's go move over a little bit. There's the front windscreen. That front windscreen gets to 610 degrees. We're going to zoom into the critical items here. There's our angle of attack gauge. We fly at 6 degrees angle of attack. We try to get it down a little. If you manage the center of gravity, you can get down to about 5.5 degrees. Very, very critical. Uh, about it, 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 it's limited to about 14 alpha. In the turn, we get up to about eight. Uh, here's our air refueling switches. Uh, this is an airspeed indicator, but we really don't use that uh, much at all. Uh, this is our primary. It's called a triple display indicator. It's called a TDI, which gives us equivalent airspeed, not not indicated airspeed. We're flying on equivalent airspeed at speed. This gauge may read 520 knots at Mach 3.2, but this gauge will read 410. It's the actual flow over the wing. So we're dealing with equivalent airspeed. This is a very important gauge. It gives us equivalent airspeed, altitude, and Mach. And as Doug knows, for a simulator, if we have a mission that requires you to fly at 3.0 and you're flying at 2.99, that isn't good enough. If you can fly at 3.99, you can fly at 3.0. Our missions are 3.0, 2.8, and 3.15. So if the mission is called for 3.15 and you're doing 3.14 for no reason, you best be flying at 3.15. That's the requirement. Okay, this is the most innocuous gauge and probably, oops, sorry, get too fast here, but probably the most important. Why is that gauge right there reading about 14 and a half PSI? Anybody think? What's the cabin pressure? What's the pressure of the earth right now here? about 14.7. At altitude, the outside cabin pressure, cabin, uh, the outside pressure is 0.4 PSI. This is the inlet recovery pressure the engine sees. At Mach 3.2, the compression ratio was 40 to 1. The engine is seeing 16 pounds per square inch at 80,000 feet. That's how good the Mach compression is for the airplane. The problem is when you compress something, it's like blowing up your, like, uh, like uh, 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 filling a scuba tank. What's the penalty for pressurizing something? It's temperature. The temperature gets up to 800 degrees. So the engine is seeing, the engine thinks it's 1,000 feet underground, 
But the problem is, although it's getting 16 PSI pressurization, it's at 800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's one of the issues. The plane is a thermal nightmare and will burn itself up. Okay, I don't want to see that light. I don't want to see Doug gone. That's the RSO eject light. I'd rather not see that ever. Uh, here's our, uh, at the lower center, here's our spike indicators, our door indicators. Uh, about 95% of the time, maybe 90, the auto inlets work perfectly. They're automatically controlled. We can manage the F doors. Every once in a while, we have, an in, we have a problem, and we can manage the spike by hand and manage the door by hand. We would rather not do that because the automatic system is more efficient, and we build a little drag. The worst thing you want for the airplane is to have the forward doors open, and you have subsonic air getting into the supersonic windscreen, and that's where the drag. The drag on the airplane is a lot to do with the doors and where the door position is. And here, whoops, Scott, sorry about that. This is kind of tough to maneuver. God, come on, guys. Okay, here are the switches. Spike switch left and right, door switch left and right. We have trim switches. I'm going to zoom out again here. I'm going to move over. Go up a little bit. Okay. There's our pie plate, visibility, standby attitude indicator, main attitude indicator. We have a pitch bar and a steering bar. At, at, if, you move a, if you make a one degree pitch change at Mach 3.2, it's 3,500 feet per minute. So we're not making a one degree pitch change. We're making 20, 20 it's a very, very minor pitch changes. You don't make a two degree pitch change in this airplane. The VVI will go to 7,000 feet per minute. So we're dealing in twentieths of a degree of, of a pitch. It's very minute. We have an HSI indicator, which is a, basically a heading situation indicator. Uh, as Doug said, he has a big map display in the back. I've got a small map display. And it's a Rube Goldberg. It's pasted together. It's just on a running, running bar. And you can move it. And it automatically uh, tells you where you are uh, if you want to do that. There's our stick. On the bottom, here's all our annunciator lights. Uh, we have uh, 49 annunciator lights, and you got to know where they are. Uh, this is a surface rudder limiter. Uh, after takeoff, we limit the, the deflection of the rudder for dynamic reasons. Uh, there's our stick. Okay, coming back up. We're now still at the front of the airplane. We'll move over a little bit. Every, every cockpit needs a clock. Have you, ever, have you ever used the clock in the back, Doug? I don't know. I, I, I don't think I've... Uh, Tom, have you ever used the clock? Edie, have you ever used the clock? No, seriously. I'm serious. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's an altitude indicator, uh, and basically, once we get airborne and go to the tanker, we basically use the triple display indicator for both speed, altitude, and Mach. This becomes an, these two gauges become uh, really irrelevant as we... Uh, as we accelerate, we don't look at the altitude and don't look at the VVI. We're looking at the, uh, at, at the TDI indicator. Okay, engine instruments to the right. We have RPM. Uh, the idle is 3,900. The engine flies at a constant 7,000, approximately 7,000 RPM. And if you, take the, if you take the engine and move it back to idle, the RPM doesn't change it. The, the engine is basically running at idle, fuel-wise, at speed. Uh, you, you, can't, you don't change the RPM. Uh, fire lights, which I'd rather not see once in a while. Uh, two, uh, two EGT gauges. You think these are digital, but they're just counters. They're just manual counters. And once again, I can change the EGT of the airplane's engine by those two switches. I can up trim and down trim the engine. I can slightly change the thrusting of the engine. And be that becomes very valuable at specific times. Nozzle indicator. Fuel flow, uh, when we take off, each engine's fuel flow is 74,000 pounds per hour. Each engine, we're burning, uh, for the first two minutes, we're burning 150,000 pounds per hour for the first two minutes. It takes us 5,000 pounds from starting the engine to get to the end of the runway. And that takes us another 5,000 pounds in two minutes to get from the end of the runway to the tanker's altitude of 24,000 feet. So in the first, first 30 minutes, 40 minutes of the, of the flight, we've just used 10,000 pounds of fuel. And we're burning 74,000 pounds per engine for the first two minutes of flight. 
Uh, you, you will look at it and you kind of went, oh boy, we're burning a lot of gas. Hydraulic, hydraulics, uh, oil pressure, all the engine instruments. We're moving over here and we're on the right side. Let me, let me move out uh, tactfully here if I can. We're on the right side of the canopy. And this stuff, this is a little sealant. After a while, when the plane's new and you, uh, you fly a plane that just came out of depot, when you open up your face mask, you go like this. <laughs> What's that smell? Remember, the cockpit canopy is 620 degrees. Some of that starts to burn inside, and you can actually smell it burning inside the cockpit. But uh, that's just sealant. Okay, we're going to zoom into the fuel and electrics here. There's our fuel gauge. 80, we can get about 81,000 pounds in the, uh, what about, uh, divide that by 6.7, you know, about 14,000 gallons. Our liquid nitrogen, and everybody says, well, what liquid nitrogen? At 3.2, the fuel gets up to 320 degrees inside the tanks. So we have to inert the tanks as they get dry with fuel vapor. Uh, we're limited in Mach if we don't have any liquid nitrogen. We have three doers of liquid nitrogen and we purge, we change it into gas obviously, and we purge, the, we, we purge the fuel tanks with inert nitrogen so the tanks don't blow up at speed. Uh, and if we don't have liquid nitrogen, we cannot go Mach 3, we're limited to 2.6. We, we really can't fly a mission. Liquid nitrogen is critical to the safety for the fuel tanks of this airplane. Okay, we're coming down to the fuel. Here's all our fuel tanks. We have six fuel tanks. We can manage, as uh, Doug said, uh, our CG gauge is really, really important. And there's a little bit of technique here. Uh, you know, the, uh, if you move the CG back to near 25, which is the limit, uh, you can actually manage the angle of attack and you'll watch the fuel flow go down. The further you move the CG back, the fuel flow will decrease, the angle of attack decreases, but the risk goes up because now your, your, your stability gets a little bit more in question. So we, we, we don't go much past 25 AO, uh, uh, C, CG. We have our fuel tank pressure, and this may be innocuous, but it's pretty important because we need nitrogen pressure in the fuel tanks to inert the tanks because remember, the fuel gets heated up to about 300 degrees. Okay, our transfer switches, uh, our generators, we have two emergency gener uh, two, uh, two generators, and uh, I've always, I made this mistake. If you look down here, emergency is up and on is down. And the first time I was, second time I was in the B model, they said generator switch is on, and you know, up becomes on. And I took the switch and raised it to emergency. So we had to shut down and restart. But you know, you, you only make that mistake once, but down is on and emergency is up for whatever reason that we, it was, that's the way it was built. Uh, batteries, we have a, a very complex electrical system. Uh, the, the bird, uh, if it has a generator failure, we have to land. Uh, we had the, one of the B models was lost with a double generator failure. Uh, we couldn't get the fuel to the tanks. The boost pump shut down, so we, we lost our, one of the B models due to a double generator failure. Uh, whoops, let me not go too fast. Whoops, too fast here. Okay, moving over. Here's our tank select switch. So if I select tank six, this will show me how much fuel in tank six or tank one. But you can get about, if it's cold, you can get about 81,000 pounds of gas. The bird weighs 60,000 and carries 81,000 pounds of gas. Okay, moving down here to our stability augmentation. This is the new DAFIC system. Uh, there's no, it's kind of a rudimentary autopilot. Track-wise, it's automatic, but there's no pitch autopilot. Uh, we, there's a mock hole that didn't work where well, the trim hole didn't work. So you're really flying the pitch. There's no automatic pitch hold in the autopilot. You're managing the pitch wheel manually, and you have to be judicious. You cruise climb at about uh, two to 300 feet a minute. You're, you're, every 5,000 pounds of gas, you're, you're gaining about 1,500 feet. So we're just in a cruise climb. We start at, at Mach 3, we'll start at 72, wind up at 76. At Mach 3.15, we'll start at 75 and wind up at 80. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting autopilot. Uh, there's the two pitch wheels. There's our pitch wheel, our roll wheel. Uh, TACAN channels, navigation's in the back. Uh, all the calm, and Doug and I flew the first mission, we totally lost calm. Uh, Supply of engine switches and all the circuit breakers and every once in a while you have to know where a circuit breaker is. Some of them pop, uh, but you manage a couple of circuit breakers. 
And now, where we, are we? We're on the right side. We're on the right side of the cockpit, and that's where we'd be sitting with our arm. And let's go back slowly. And I'll zoom in. And basically, that's what you're going to see. That's what you're going to, it's all steam gauges. Now, it, why, why no digital? Why not a glass cockpit? Come on, guys. What's the worst thing for your computer? Temperature. Glass, glass wouldn't work. Analog, every gauge. You'd, you'd come back from a flight after six hours, and the maintenance people would say, what went wrong? Oh, we popped a couple of circuit breakers. The EGT gauge fluctuated. Uh, the all gauge broke. Everything else was fine. And we just did six hours of three Mach 3 flights, up to 600, down to minus 56, up to 600, down to minus 56. And we had two circuit breakers pop. The EGT gauge flucked, and one of the, one of the oil pressure gauges went. And that's how good the, the, the airplane worked. It worked every, every single time. We were so blessed. Okay, any, any questions? Come on, guys. You got questions or not? If not, well, thank you. And when you get up to the cockpit, now you know what you're seeing. When you look in the cockpit, it's a, it's a steam gauge airplane. It's a cable airplane. When you look at the sticks, there's, there are cables from the sticks 100 feet, 105 feet back to a mixer section, and the cables are tuned to the exact expansion coefficient of the airplane. Doesn't matter whether you're flying Mach 3.2 at 600 degrees or coming down behind a tanker, the stick feels exactly the same. And the airplane has expanded and contracted four inches and you never know the difference. That's how well the airplane was designed. It's an absolute, it's an absolute marvel, a total marvel. Question, go. Oh no, it was engineered enough. Uh, the, yeah, we, we, we uh, knew the boomers uh, hooking up. You know, you had to get used to uh, 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 being in afterburner once in a while. But uh, no, uh, uh, once you get used to tanking, uh, the, uh, we had a great relationship with the 135 people, and the boomer knew who we was, uh, who we were, and hooking up was not an issue. The, the, there was nothing special about the tankers carry JP7, which is not Jet A, uh, but no, uh, uh, they were they were specially assigned to us, and that was a blessing because we knew who they were and they, there was nothing mystical about it. Got it? Okay. Great. Anything else? Anything else for Doug? Well, guys, when you get to the cockpit, now at least you know what you're viewing and go to the back seat and uh, you'll see how crowded the back seat is. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.